Hello, and welcome to Velaction Continuous Improvement's presentation on how to use the Decision Matrix template. In short, a Decision Matrix is a tool to organize a precise method of choosing between a set of options. When there are many factors in a decision, it can be hard to sort out which one is really the best. Often, a motion rules, and a choice can be easily biased. Okay, let's start out by looking at the Decision Matrix template. Now you'll notice that there's a series of tabs along the bottom, and the first one is the overview, which contains a step-by-step -step process for coming up with a good decision matrix. So the first step is to select your criteria, and because you are working as a team, this is likely to be the results of a brainstorming session. Now rather than go through that whole brainstorming session here, I'm going to go ahead and jump right to a criteria selection page I've already put together. Now you'll notice in this page, there's a list of criteria that my team has already selected, and my team in this case is my family. And the problem that we're trying to come up with a good solution for is which pet to have. So we're coming up with a good list of criteria that include the factors of how we're going to weigh our decision on, on getting a new pet for our household. Now one thing I'd like to caution you on is to make sure that when you come up with these factors, you don't have any that overlap. Like in this case, we could have put in friendliness and affection both as criteria, and those two are closely related and you're really doubling the weight of your final decision. Now as we came up with these criteria, you'll notice that there's no particular sequence yet. And that's the next step of this process. Once you have all your criteria listed, you go ahead and apply your ranking. So for my family, personal preference was our number one most important factor. So we obviously put a one in there for the rank. We continue this process through all of the other criteria that we've come up with. So our, uh, our next most important was, was uh, cleanliness. That was the most important criteria after personal preference because nobody wanted to clean up after the animal. And we continued on this list and we say um, noise is number three, cool factor might be number four, we want our pet to stick around for a while so longevity is five, and finally because the cost is just an upfront cost primarily, that's uh, fairly low because we're expecting to have this pet for a very long time. So now we've got all our rankings listed and the next step is to go down and put them in their sequence. And I like to sort them from largest to smallest. And what that lets me do is put in a index weight. So I like to use the least important factor as a one. And what that lets me do is compare that to the most important factor. In this case, our most important again is personal preference. So I click on that and decide how many times more important is personal preference than cost. So in this case, we're gonna triple the importance of that. So we put a three on the personal preference list. And we'll go through and after that, it's a matter of figuring out what the weight, weights are for the factors between those. So we chose 1.3 as our longevity. Our cool factor is 1.6, it's a little bit more important. Noise is 1.9 and um, cleanliness is two. So that gives us our weighting system. You'll also notice that as we weighted these, our percent of decision was automatically filled. And what this lets us do is decide how important each of the factors are in the big picture. So in this case, our personal preference is 28% of our total weighting system. Now, once you've decided the criteria looks good, you'll just go ahead and you'll select everything and you'll right click and copy. And the next page you'll go to is our decision matrix page. And when you get to the decision matrix page, you're going to go ahead and paste it into the weights column. Now you'll notice that the weights and criteria are listed across columns in this one and they're in rows in the other page. So you'll need to do a right click and a paste special. And of course you want to preserve the formatting so just click on values. But you're also going to click this button here and it's transpose. And what that does is it changes the uh, orientation of the table of data. So when you paste it in, you'll notice that you now have all of your data listed across instead of down. And now that we have our page set up, we'll want to put in our options. In this case, our family has selected snake, fish, dog, and cat as the options that we might um, want to consider. If you have more options than this, you can go ahead and just insert rows um, I recommend doing it above this bottom row though so you don't uh, upset the formatting. But it's, it's um, set up so you can put as many options as you want. And you'll often see that in continuous improvement projects where many, many, many potential uh, um, 
courses of action come out of brainstorming sessions. So now that you have your decision matrix table all laid out, the next step is to apply ratings. And there's a couple different ways to do this. I like to use a scale of 1 through 10 for the, the, the ratings that I use, and they'll be multiplied out by the weight and come up with the weighted score. Many people promote using a 9-3-1 system where a really good option is a 9, an okay option is a 3, and a bad option is a 1. Both are okay to use, but again, I prefer using the 1 through 10 system. It just gives more options and lets you have a little bit more of a gradient in, in the scale. The other thing to note is that in a very simple decision matrix, you can just come up with answers on the fly. You can just go through and have a team decide how, um, how each one stacks up, how each option stacks up against the criteria. If this is a big decision that has a lot of risk associated with it, you may decide instead to actually create a grading scale where you would do some data collection and compare the data you collected to a pre-established set of conditions where if it's over a certain threshold, it's a five, past the next threshold will be a six, and so on. So now that this page is all set up, we're going to go ahead and apply some of our ratings. So if my family got together and we thought, we looked into the cost of different uh, different creatures and came up with this set of scores for the cost. Oh, sorry. Um, a four, a two, an eight, and a five. And what that does is it gives us our first series of costs, but also populates our weighted scores. And you'll notice that in this case, the weighting is one, so it's all multiplied out here. Now what I've already done is I have created a decision matrix with all of this information filled out for you already. One thing to be cautious about is when you are filling out these ratings, be careful that the teams aren't watching to see the final scores being tallied as they go. There's a tendency for people to preferentially rate the options that they like the best, which will inflate the weighted score. So you may consider hiding the column with the weighted score in it. Another thing to pay attention to is the criteria you selected. If you have something with a very personal opinion based criteria, you may end up having debates forming. So in this case, you can see that I'm a dog person. It'd be very easy for me to get into disagreements with a cat person about the scoring. I'd also like you to take a look at the final weighted scores and you'll notice that snake became the highest. And you can even take this and sort them out from the largest to the smallest and put your ranks in. One, two, three, four. Now what you have is you have a fairly unexpected result became number one. If that happens, it's either because the decision making process worked and got you to something that was unexpected, or it's because there's a flaw in the system somewhere. So if you have something that just doesn't make a lot of sense, go back and look at the criteria you selected and the scores and just confirm that there's no um, inadvertent errors in the process along the way. Now in the case of my family, all four of these animals were viable options. Don't put something on your options list if it's non-starter. There are some things you come up with in a continuous improvement project that just won't make sense to do and it makes, um, it, makes it very difficult to go through this whole process and end up with a option that becomes number one but then isn't chosen for some other reason outside of the decision matrix process. And the final thing I'll say is you really do have to make sure that you act on these options. So if you go through the process and come up with an outcome that you have put this type of due diligence into, it doesn't make sense to come up with the answer and then not do anything with it. It's just a waste of your time. Um, one, one final thing you can do is you can put in a take no action as an option. And that becomes a valid choice if you do that. Just don't let it be a, a choice by default. So that wraps things up. I hope you gained a better understanding on how to put the decision matrix to use. More importantly, I hope I've inspired you to try it out the next time you have a challenging problem facing you. I'd like to finish by letting you know that I can train your team on how to use a decision matrix as well as on a variety of other continuous improvement topics you can find a complete listing in the Lean Training section of my website, www.velaction.com. I can also provide you with assistance in putting the Lean tools to use. Visit one of the links on the screen to learn more. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to get in touch with me through the contact information on the screen. Have a great day, and best wishes on your Lean journey.